Um, thank you. Welcome to this last panel. I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, set of papers, uh, registers and interlocutors, and I'd like to introduce Mary Geary. Thank Lovely. you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Geary. I'm from the University of Brighton. I'm from the School of Environment and Technology. And my re research interests are really looking at water and community in terms of sustainable futures. So thinking about how can we ensure that our water resources are kept integral as we move forward. Um, and, th and really what I'm interested in is the, the gap between climate change science and what people actually do in their everyday lives and practices. So my research, I'm a social scientist, I sit in the team of human geography at Brighton, but I also have a little foot there in natural sciences, I have a little foot there in political science, which is my background. Um, and so my work involves going into local communities and really talking to them about what they understand by changes in their local water environments and really getting to know how they live next to their water resources and how they enjoy them. And uh, this is a little picture that I'll be, I'll be referring to later on, but I want you to just check out this chap here. He's going to be an important figure as we move forward. So, um, our cultural imaginations. We know that our water resources, of course, river banks are important, landscapes are important to us, and river banks are material presences. We can touch them, we can walk along them, we can sit there, we can feel the air, we can watch the water going by. But they're also part of our cultural imaginations as well. If I ask you to take a moment and think about a river, you'll get some kind of emotional response, whether that's something positive, a really happy memory of a river, or something which is awesome, or something which reminds you of past times or past people. So cultural imaginations are really important when we think about landscapes. So for instance, this little quote here is from a, uh, an English children's book called Wind in the Willows. And these are two characters, Roll and Matty, who, uh, uh, Mole and Ratty, who are sitting on the riverbank. And the author says, when tired at last, he sat on the bank while the river chattered on to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last. And I'm sure that wherever we're from in the world, we have some, a similar kind of childhood story which connects us with our natural landscapes. So thinking about our landscape, uh, Arnold Leopold, in his Sand County Almanac, pioneered the, pioneered the idea that landscapes have multiple aspects, as we all know, ethical, aesthetic, economic, ecological. And he was one of the first to really connect different aspects of landscape with different parts of being a human. And Stokowski went on to suggest that people actively create meaningful places through conversation and interaction with others. So it's not just concerned with our interaction with our landscapes, but also how our interactions with each other, both humans and non-humans, can also refine our idea of landscapes. And so our sense of place comes from this. So our sense of place, it's a dynamic relationship, it's not static. It's both between ourselves and our environment and our reflexive, reflective responses and articulations of feelings with others. And I know that Kirsten, in her presentation today, really brought that out as well. It's not a static relationship, it's something that's very mobile and fluid. But when thinking about people and community and about really integrating with our landscapes, what I've really come to think about is time, because we have we have geographical time, we have big history, uh, the emotions of the earth, and we also have chronological time, so if you like human time, something that's much more tangible, much more accessible. And so here we have a depiction of Kronos, the god of Kronos, the god of time, and we can see that he's a venerable being with, with a long beard, and he's holding a scythe and he's holding the sands of time, representing our span of life, our continuity on Earth, which is finite and will end eventually. Um, it's interesting for me that this representation of the scythe has been co-opted as the Grim Reaper, this idea that, that the scythe is there to cut your life down. Actually, in Greek mythology, it's to do with the harvest, it's to do with seasonality, it's to do with replenishment and renewal, and our place within that cycle of life. Um, and the sands of time, that we do have a finite amount of time, and to be wary of it and be cognizant of it. And I think that's what's really important when we think about reflecting upon lives and reflecting upon our role in, in part of sustainable futures. 
So chronos represents certainty, vulnerability, and assuredness. But along comes the capricious Kairos, who's more vigorous and more muscular, and there he is with his scales, his balances. So the Kairos time are those intersections, those interstitial moments of our lives where we take different, we make different choices and we take different directions. And our lives are a mix of both. They're both the mix of the chronological, which moves along at a certain pace, and these moments of explosion and decision and different pathways. So here that's represented by the tipping point of the scales. Which way are we going to go? And if we think about sustainable futures, we could say, well, which way? Are we at the tipping point now? Which way are we going to go? So kairos represents uncertainty, capriciousness, and renewal. And you could say you can't have kairos without chronos, and you can't have chronos without kairos. So I'll be coming back to that as we look a little bit further at the work that I've been doing. So again, Kairos and Kronos, the ebb and flow of our sensory experiences through life, shaping ourselves and marking out the events which define us and who we are, and how we live with others. And that's really the crucial part. How do we live as humans, with other humans and with non-humans, with our landscapes and with other creatures of the world? So my work. So my work is focused in England. Uh, and I'm really interested, as I said, about going to the water side and talking to local communities about their experiences of changing water environments. Now, sadly, I didn't have a prosthetic arm and I didn't have any impregnated gym socks, but I did have a dictaphone and I did have a notepad. And as part of that, I talked to people in three interconnected waterside villages in this part of the River Ada, which is in West Sussex in England. Um, and it's stunning. Uh, Upper Beading and um, Bramber, which are three very quite small villages. Um, but, and I've got lots of stories that came out of talking to people. I talked to a wide range of people. I talked to farmers. I talked to business people. I talked to artists. I talked to energy workers, which doesn't involve uh, utilities. It actually involves the spirit world. Um, I talked to emergency service workers, I talked to local residents, I talked to a huge swathe of people and I had lots of stories that came out of it, but today I only want to talk about one because of the time that we have together. So, this is the River Ada and thinking about time we can see here different spans of time, different uses of the river over time. So. Uh, here we have, it's the First World War, uh, the soldiers here use the river to go down to the main port in Shoreham, uh, which is about seven miles away, to then go and be dispatched overseas. Here, this is an, an old canal boat that was used for the cement works, which was a really important part of the local economy right up into the 1950s. Uh, and this used to just chug up and down, it would use the, the tidal flow of the river to get it up and the tidal flow of the river to get it down. Here. This refers back to that first picture that I showed you. This is a recreational activity. This is the annual charity boat race where people of the local villages would come together for one day only. Uh, they would raise money by rowing boats down the river. And when I talked to, the, to you about the chap with the thing in his bag, well, those were unpleasant things in the bag. It could be any manner of things. The most benign would be rotten tomatoes or rotten eggs. And there'd be other matter in the bag as well. And the idea was you were supposed to get your opponents covered in besmirched in all sorts of unmentionables and throw them in the river. And finally here, it's a little bit unclear, but this is, these are sultans. This, years and years ago, uh, about mid-1700s, early 1800s, there was salt making that was also happening in the valley. Now this used to be a salt plain, so this used to, these, these spoil heaps here, the sultans where, uh, where, the, where the, the, the soil was dumped, um, and this used to be where the river flowed. So the river's course has changed quite a lot in the last 200 years. So when I talk about the wayfaring river, I am talking about actually the river physically moving in this part of the, of the catchment. But what I want to talk to you about, really, is this, this small community that I worked with in Stenning. Uh, and this is Mouse Lane. This is the bottom of Mouse Lane here. And this is the top. And you can see there's a big difference between the two. This is at the very top. This sits underneath the South Downs, which is this part of, of the river catchment here. The South Downs are this uh, string of chalk downlands, which uh, span 100 miles in the south of England. And Stenning sits down here, like many of the other villages along the South Downs. It's what you would say quintessential bucolic English countryside, 
of our cultural imaginations. And when we think of rolling hills, we think of something like this. Now, this is interesting because this is the rural aspect of the lane, which connects up to the downs up here, and it's higher up. This is the lower part, the residential part. This part here is owned by Lord Goring. This part here isn't. This is local residents with houses where people have moved to uh, to be part of this South Downs landscape. But these, so the, here is a mix between local people that have lived here a very long time and the people who have retired here after they finish their working lives, looking for this, this wonderful romantic experience of living in this beautiful part of the countryside. Up here, as you can see, it's very rutted, and down here, it's all tarmac. So there's kind of different aesthetics as well to do with the, the, the topography of the, of the road. And the reason why I'm talking about the Wayfaring Riverbank is here is a natural spring that runs all the way down the road, right from the top to the bottom, because the, da the downs here act as a big chalk aquifer. They basically store the water when it falls. It comes down, and it will eventually end up underneath the ground, but part of that is this spring which is here all year round and this is a lovely thing this a lot of people move to the lane because of the spring because it's a lovely natural fe feature they often um, will sail little paper boats down it some of my respondents talked to me about taking their grandchildren and, and sailing the paper boats down here and this has always been a lovely thing people love the fact that this is sitting on the roadside and the, the lane has a lot of history as well. Uh, there's a little plaque halfway up, which is um, a poem that a soldier in the First World War wrote about missing this particular lane and missing this walk from the village up to the top of the lane onto the downs uh, and wishing that he was here. So it's, it's, this means, means a lot, this lane means a lot to the local community. However, the benign roadside spring is not always so benign. Sometimes it turns into a river. And the question is, why does it turn into a river? Is it just because of heavy rainfall? Uh, is it just because that's what happens every now and again? Well, that is true. Sometimes, naturally, this would happen. But unfortunately, this is also a story about governance, and it's a story of uh, ownership of land and land use management practices. Because, as I said to you, at the top of the lane is the estate of Lord Goring. Um, and I've got to know about this lane because... Um, I talked to some local residents and they said you must speak to the Maritime Residents Association because they're campaigning against the fact that their road is flooded and it's often like this three or four months of the year, which means that they can't easily get into their homes. Uh, their, their cars get damaged by cars driving down and debris in the water smashing and hitting their windows. And they feel a sense of, of great aggravation that their beautiful lane is not beautiful anymore. So what's caused the change as well? Land management techniques at the top of the lane. Lord Goring has, is the new incumbent, and he has decided to change how he manages his land, how he farms his land, and the types of crops he uses. And the residents say that this has had a direct effect on this flooding. There's also an issue of political austerity. There's been a huge cut in local government money, which has meant that drainage management for all of the communities, actually, not just Mouse Lane, uh, have also had problems so that, that culverts, which run underneath the road, get blocked. It means that uh, the soil, the, the tarmac gets eroded, and all of this ends up washing down to where the, the residents live at the lower part of the lane. Uh, heavier rainfall events are not factored into the budgeting of the road servicing or the highways management. And there is a reliance, actually, on the parish councils to try and deal with this problem. But the parish councillors are almost overwhelmingly people in their mid to late 60s. They're all retired. They haven't got an experience in government administration before. A lot of the time, they are looking for a different way of occupying themselves post-work. And so getting involved in parish council work has been something that they've when I've talked to parish councillors, they've really loved doing it. It's so different from their other day-to-day -day work that they did professionally. But the other side is they can never get away from it. When I've been in parish councillors' houses, the phone never stops ringing with people asking for help. So there are lots of different issues with the lane. And there's a sense of, of well, it's changed things in lots of different ways. First of all, these people that I talk to here, these are part of the residents' associations. They help clear the road. They help try and make sure it's maintained. But they do what they can. As they say to me, they're getting older and they can't do the things they used to do. So it's had 
various effects this, this, this issue of the flooding on the road has brought people together, that's one thing. They said that they've lived on this road for some time and they don't know their other neighbours. It was only getting involved in this association that they got to know each other. But there is a sense of loss. When I was you know, going back to this idea of, um, uh, of Kairos and Kronos, having to get involved in political activities on this particular road has meant that a lot of them now reflect back and question about the way they've lived their lives and the, the way that they've really only become politicised that's telling me I've got to finish up that they've only become politicised later in life which is very frustrating for them because now they're thinking well what legacy do I hand on what kind of memory do I hand on what have I actually done with my time on earth so thinking about this, I just briefly was thinking about this, a poet called Douglas Livingston, who, um, who was a marine biologist, but he also became a poet. And for him, his life, his work, his identity were all connected together. And I think this is a realisation that's happened for these people that were a part of this residence association. They're not seeing their lives as fragmented, they're seeing it as all connected together and thinking about what will happen for their children, their grandchildren, not in terms of whether their road gets flooded, but actually in terms of political activity and sustainable futures and working together to make a difference and to make a change. So conclusions. So waterscapes are an intimate part of our sense of place and our sense of self. That the riverbank represents both permanence and continuity, change and uncertainty akin to monsoon waters. That this dialectic is also firm when we consider Kronos and Kairos time they're both essential elements of a life lived, but how do we reconcile the two together? And the riverbank is a mutable concept. We think about the Sultans and we think about the roadside spring. We like to think of riverbanks being somewhere permanent, but actually there is mobile. The landscapes are as mobile as we are in our own lives. And as humans, we're embedded within the landscapes within which we live and connected to others with whom we share these landscapes. Thank you for your attention. Right. Uh, hey everyone, um, I'm David White. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in UCL Anthropology and I specialise in the anthropology of coastal uh, landscapes and the ethnography of surfing. So I'm going to talk today about um, artificial wave pools and the difference in the experience of surfing in the sea versus surfing in an artificial wave pool. So I thought first I'd better show you a video of what I'm actually talking about to uh, frame this discussion. Way, artificial waves have been around for a while, uh, two or three decades, um, but in a way that surfers ignored. They were kind of a novelty. Uh, if we watch this, this is kind of the old style artificial wave. Uh, the power comes, all the power is at the start. The wave comes out at once, it breaks at once. There's nowhere to surf to or anything like this. And, it remained in kind of swimming pools and stuff like that. Um, that all changed in 2015. Two companies uh, came out out of, out of the blue because they were keeping the technology secret um, with a new design for a new artificial wave that looked more like this. And surfers have taken this very seriously. Uh, that is as good, as good as nature can offer you. And um, this is um, kind of started a huge debate in the, uh, in the surfing, in surfing culture about uh, surfing purism. Is this surfing? Can you learn here? What are you if you surf here? Are you a surfer or are you kind of, you know, a customer or whatever? Uh, so this, my, this is what my paper is based on today. Um, I did ethnography at one of these, the first one in the world that's open, the only one in the world currently open. Uh, is in Wales, it's, in the, it's not only in Wales. So um, my paper is about the experience of surfing there and what might happen to surfing in a wave pool versus in the sea. So one of the most frustrating aspects of surfing is actually finding good waves to surf. Between the ever-changing weather, the increasingly overcrowded nature of surf breaks and the commitments and responsibility of surfers, it can indeed be challenging to maintain consistent practice. Accordingly, every surfer dreams of the possibility of man-made waves that break to the perfection at the touch of a button. 
In 2015, this became reality with the opening of Surf Snowdonia in North Wales, home to a wave pool capable of generating waves comparable to those that surface surf in the ocean. There are now dozens of these either in planning or construction phase worldwide. Uh, in this talk, I'll explore one key question. What is the difference between the relationship cultivated with the environment while practicing in a wave pool versus while being submerged in salt water at the coast? As water and waves are commodified, how are they altered by their relocation from coast to pool? I'll begin by describing approaches to the concepts of nature and artifice that cast them not as essential categories, but rather as performances or relationships. I'll then go on to present ethnography, demonstrating how artifice is described and experienced at Surf Snowdonia. I'll use this to claim that surfers do not only cultivate a relationship with waves, but rather that by becoming drenched in salt water, surfers allow their bodies to communicate with, with an ecology of atmospheric forces. And this, is, this is opportunity is absent in the wave pool landscape. So the anthropological investigation into what makes one environment artificial when compared to another evokes long-standing meta-theoretical inquiry into the relationship between nature and culture, or the Western tendency to equate man-made with artificial to greater or lesser extents. Environmental sociologist Bronislaw Zerzinski, I hope that's right, discusses how nature can be understood as a performance engaged in by humans and non-humans alike. As such, nature, and I suggest artifice, is best understood, and I quote Zerzinski, as a process open to improvisation, creativity, and emergence. Similarly, James Carrier cautions against analyses which are based on assessing the naturalness or artifice of environments per se, as it risks producing ethnocentric uh, descriptions of what each concept is constituted by. Instead, he suggests not, again I quote, to study environments, study people's relationships with their surroundings. To approach wave pools in, uh, and the surface that use them with such an understanding is to dislocate artifice from any one thing, be it water, material, body, etc., and instead to examine its emergence in design, practice, and finally in comparison to oceanic waves. So now we'll talk about wave pool design. This is a kind of a schematic map of surf Snowdonia. Um, it's in an old reservoir, and I'll talk about the mechanism in the middle uh, in a second. So, as the environmental and material register of waves is radically altered in wave pools, they and their surroundings undergo a series of transformations which earns them the designation of artificial among surfers. Firstly, they require a pool large enough to contain the wave generating technology and support multiple surfers at a time. The wave pool at Surf Snowdonia in Wales, for instance, is located in a repurposed reservoir which already had the elliptical shape needed to run the wave engine. And this is the new technology that artificial waves is apparently awaiting. Um, it's basically a submerged snowplow that runs you know, forward and back under this kind of piece protected by chicken wire fence. And that's what gives the consistent force that drives the wave that actually lets you surf it and not just kind of this bump in a pool. Uh, so uh, while the atmosphere is capable of producing ocean waves free of charge, running this engine is costly. Accordingly, there needs to be more on offer here than just the wave. At the entrance to the park, there's a surf shop, a bar, a restaurant, a boutique glamping site on the opposite shore, and a kid's activity center. Uh, I was taken aback by the relative lack of effort made to relate this wave to the ocean. There is almost no surf brand advertising visible, no wave murals, no blue or sand colors used in the decor. The profit-oriented necessity of targeting a certain group of consumers in design has given the impression of a family activity center and not an attempt at reproducing the coast and land. Uh, there are distinct phenomenal differences between surfing here and in the ocean. The base of the pool feels padded underfoot and is a light beige colour that does not resemble any rock, but perhaps would look like sand if it weren't covered in a layer of slime. Um, the fresh water, no salt, is brown like a river in flood. Uh, it does not leave a layer of salt on the skin afterwards and is also pleasantly balmy when compared to the Welsh coast water. Uh, surfers wait their turn in the shallows and then paddle 20 or so metres to the takeoff zone, remaining in position by holding onto the chicken wire, which protects the mechanism while lying on their stomachs. Every 90 seconds, a noise like a lawnmower engine starts uh, from the far side of the wave maker's track. A wave appears suddenly from nowhere and drives forth towards the waiting surfers. Once the allotted time is up, surfers paddle to the edge and, after briefing the incoming bunch, move towards the change room where a hot shower awaits, a final phenomenal peculiarity. Artifice begins to emerge in Snowdonia with respect to the design of the facility and the materiality of the wave pool. So, so superficially, one might assume that artifice is indeed best understood in this context as a quality of the physical objects of Snowdonia, the foremost presumably being the wave itself. Such an understanding, however, is complicated by considering how surfing social relations are also transformed here in the course of practice. So now I'm going to start talking about prestige, surfing prestige. So prestige at an ocean surf break is tied to surfing skill, but in a broad sense. 
including expertise at reading waves, ability to compete for waves, and knowing how to bend the rules of surfing etiquette in order to end up in the most desirable positions. The pay-to-surf nature of Snowdonia and a turnstile system whereby surfers surf inhibit these practical political aspects. During an hour-long session, three, sur three surfers share 37 waves, meaning that whichever surfer is invited to jump in first will get an extra 13th wave, and the others will get 12. Uh, at the end of one particular hour, one surfer was not so pleased. I got a wave less than everyone else, he started shouting. Um, uh, too much um, eye rolling by the lifeguards and a kind of speech that sounded learnt off, you know, like these are the amount of waves per hour and there's this amount of minutes, so this is how you get, and he jumped in first. Um, but anyway, so this surfer was annoyed because the money he had paid to guarantee him access to the wave had bought him one less ride than his fellow surfer, at which point he felt the organisers were to blame. At a surf break, the difference between his wave count and that of the others would boil down to nothing but the difference in skill between them. There was nobody to receive a complaint in the ocean. Authenticity, that is being a real surfer versus a fake or poser surfer, is to be adept at battling other surfers in order to take one's place in the social hierarchy and be gifted waves both by others and by the sea. Hence the simmering suspicion of these artificial waves in surf culture. They allow the totally unqualified into an environment that mimics one which surfers revere and spend a lifetime amassing the skill necessary for its negotiation. On the one hand then, the commodification of the surfing environment that wave pools represents could be viewed as having a democratising effect on surfer sociality. It's no longer the survival of the fittest on the water. Everyone can get a fair share of waves, provided that is of course that they can pay for their fair share of waves. Um, on the other hand, however, they eliminate much of the surfing, the activities aside from standing upright on the board. Accordingly, most surfers deal with the thought of the emerging class, with a, a very much emerging class, of surfers who are learning in wave pools, but cannot go negotiate the rips, tides and paddling that it takes to surf in the ocean by simply stating that they have never actually surfed and so cannot be considered surfers. So, it is not only the wave and surrounding landscape at Surf Snedonia that is artificial, but the surfers and surfing within also become artificial as they are transformed by this place. It seems that artifice, as surfers understand it, is not a quality of things, but rather a property of the relationship between them. That is to say, what is artificial at Snowdonia is the manner in which surfers and waves interact. The actual waves at Snowdonia are very much comparable to those at the coast, uh, but the process of their causation are very different. A wave pool is driven by electricity, which turns gears or powers engines. An oceanic wave, on the other hand, is the final movement in the life of a far-off storm system, which blew the wind to excite the ocean that caused the wave to travel for hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometres. This wave finally meets a surfer sufficiently skilled in swell and weather reading who manages to find it. It is, the, it is with this much wider relationship with atmosphere that surfing is really concerned. Uh, so consider the following answer given by an informant when I asked him to compare his experience of a day's ocean surfing to the wave pool equivalent. And I'll quote him at, at some length. He said, uh, a large part of what is attractive about surfing is the unpredictability, that you feel like in some way you've mastered this unpredictable force out in the ocean. Like today, you've pulled up to this crag of reef in the middle of nowhere, read the tide and wind and everything has come together. You see it and you think, is this even surfable? So you paddle out and everything's a bit of a mess, but then you get one and everything changes. And that might be the one patch of coastland with that one wave coming through for hundreds of kilometres. So you feel total joy and at the sense of accomplishment. Whereas when you're showing up to a wave pool and you know what the, wa what the wave is going to do and, you know, that it's going to, and it's, you know that it's going to be doing it and there's a guy pushing a button, that just definitely takes a lot away from it. What my informant identifies here is how the interaction of surfer and wave is actually epiphenomenal to a much deeper and more holistic relationship with an ecology of the atmospheric forces that bind surfers' bodies to the storms. As such, when surfers perform nature at the coast or evoke it in their speech, they're indexing an instance of communication with a widely dispersed and varied materiality and movement. When the surfer-wave relationship is deemed to be natural, it offers an opportunity for a scaling of energies from the very large, like solar energy, to the very small, such as the minutiae of each skilled bodily movement, via the transformative potential of storms. Conversely, artifice is performed at a wave pool by virtue of the fact that storms, winds, and knowledge of each no longer matters. The wave pool certainly takes place but that place separates surfers from their atmosphere of practice. Um, and I thought I might add something like this instead. This is a particularly good uh, oceanic waves. And you can see these cords of movement, cords of wave energy coming in, kind of vanishing into the atmosphere where they come from. Um, and this idea of volume that we were talking about as well earlier, like on a phenomenal level, this is infinite compared to what's available in a wave pool. Um, 
and is much more exciting to a surfer. So the movement from an oceanic register to a commercial register is being heralded by, its, by wave pool creators as, emancipa as emancipatory and as instigating a new era of surfing. It can offer landlocked communities the opportunity to experience a globally celebrated pursuit, allow professionals to hone their skills in a controlled environment where waves are ever present and provide unprecedented opportunities for the development of the sport. As of Tokyo 2020, surfing will be an Olympic event and for organisational reasons and to make it spectator friendly, the events will be held at yet to be built wave pools. On the other hand, this continued commodification of the surfing environment provides yet more opportunities for the economic exclusion due to the cost of pool use and pool placement in affluent areas. It follows that in processes of, te of the technological transformation of waterscapes, we need to be mindful of both the liberal positive narrative of technology driven development and democratisation and the unintended consequence of this technological transformation. The former claims to, to remove cultural barriers to access, but only with an accompanying price tag. Perhaps more fundamentally, however, the latter points to the fact that by relocating waves, one does not necessarily relocate surfing. What separates real waves from artificial waves is not primarily that the latter is in some respect man-made or the former salty. The realness is rather found in practices of weathering the elements, finding waves among the rocks, with the winds, rocks and water of the world. It is a relationship in which the power and danger of these natural forces is recognised, but also actively engaged. To surf is to find a way to make the human body amenable to forces which would otherwise destroy it. In a wave pool, with a padded bottom, a strict schedule to which uniform waves roll with the press of a button, with carefully signposted takeoff zones, a relationship with the interplay of elemental forces is not possible. Becoming a surfer at Snedonia takes place to a different logic than becoming, surfer, becoming a surfer at the coast. It is almost teleological, taking place to pre-designed plans in a facility full of signposts, and with just one identical path to and from the wave. This is in contrast to the fickle waves of the coast which require imagination and creativity if they are to be negotiated. Ethnographic inquiry into surfing and artificial waves reveals these hidden cultural logics, but also the depth of the beauty of human relationships with landscapes. Perhaps such insights might inspire wave pool users to stay in touch with the coast too and discover a different kind of value. Thank you very much. Next up, last but not least, is Beth Cullen, and it's nice to end with someone who's involved in the project right here, and she's going to talk about monsoon infrastructures and Chennai's rainwater tanks. Thank you. Um, so it's another talk about tanks. <laughs> Um, uh, this presentation is based on archival research and fieldwork conducted for monsoon assemblages. Um, and this presentation is a summary of a longer paper that I'm currently working on that explores the intersections between the monsoon and the lived environment in Chennai through tank infrastructures that have historically shaped and managed monsoon matter. And I will cover a bit of similar ground to Rukumani and Avantika's presentations, but I'll also talk about my fieldwork around a tank in contemporary Chennai. Um, so Chennai, formerly Madras, has a paradoxical relationship with monsoon rainfall, with a long history of both flooding and water shortages. In recent years, incidents of scarcity and excess have intensified with extreme flooding in 2015 and acute water shortages in 2017. And although some attempts have been made to link these events to climate change, um, residents of Chennai are adamant that flood and drought are human-made. And there's a commonly held perception that tanks play a prominent role in these dynamics. Uh, so the landscape of Chennai was historically permeated by tanks. Um, but during 400 years of urbanisation, they've been modified with many of them disappearing completely. And as a result, um, Chennai has lost its characteristic wetness, making it more vulnerable to monsoonal extremes. Due to recent incidents of uh, flood and drought, urban publics are reassessing the value of the tanks and engaging with them in new ways. And my research aims to make a contribution to current understandings by exploring how the tanks came into being as monsoonal infrastructures, how the tanks have, have changed over time and the consequences of these changes for the relationship with the monsoon. Assemblage thinking provides a useful framework for understanding the tanks because it draws attention to the ways in which humans and non-humans are mutually involved in world-making processes. And conceptualizing uh, tank infrastructures as assemblages enables them to be understood as bundles of relationships. 
Um, as, as anthropologist Ashley Cass um, argues, infrastructure is not a specific class of artefact or system, but an ongoing process of relationship building. So tanks are gatherings of diverse elements which combine to form a meshwork of interconnected territories. And this isn't ideal, but um, this image of a tank, um, Sri Lankan tank, uh, goes some way towards representing the different components of the assemblage, um, which include the physical structure, the surrounding agricultural fields and the catchment area, the associated trees, crops, fish, birds and plants, the human communities living in the area and other connected water bodies. So these are dynamic gatherings of corresponding entities entangled through human practice. And they're not static, they're processual uh, compositions that are always becoming. Um, and from their pre-colonial origins, um, the tanks have been reimagined, reworked and maintained by successive generations according to different sociocultural, economic and political frames. And these shifting interests have had material consequences and, and are reflected in different configurations of the tanks. Uh, so changes in their form, their perceived value, their maintenance and non-maintenance reflect attitudes to the monsoon, but they also influence how the monsoon is experienced. Uh, so as we saw earlier with Avantika's talk, um, tanks, uh, and also Rukumani's, um, tanks have reassembled the climate and environment of South India over centuries. Um, and as this area falls within the rain shadow of the Western Ghats, which impede rains from the southwest monsoon, uh, tanks were created in relation to rains brought by the northeast monsoon. And recent research suggests that uh, tank construction really pr proliferated during the medieval climate anomaly, uh, which saw a substantial increase in northeast monsoon rainfall and a deficit of southwest monsoon rainfall. So, this uh, construction of the tanks required um, an understanding of connections between monsoon rains, watercourses and sediment flows, drainage patterns and the topography of the land. So they were not really an imposition of human design on inert materials, but the result of a creative engagement with the land and the weather. So from this perspective, tanks can be understood as an emergent infrastructure created through the coming together of numerous agencies. Uh, so formed by constructing crescent earthen, uh, crescent shaped earthen buns next to naturally occurring depressions where water tended to gather, they were designed to spread water over the land and to extend rains through the year. The buns created ripples in the landscape that slowed water down, spreading it out into broad shallow pools and encouraging it to soak into the ground. Individual tanks were interlinked with other tanks forming cascades. Um, and these weren't really developed as a system um, all at once, but in a piecemeal fashion. The shape, the size, and the ecologies of the tank shifted through the year and from year to year, creating a fluid, dynamic, and vibrant territory. But the role of the tanks went far beyond irrigation and blue water. Each tank created a microclimate, which contributed to the broad, broader macroclimate of the region. They cultivated wetness in many forms, in the soil, in the plants, in the air moderating temperatures, humidity and air fluxes in their surroundings. They were even believed to attract clouds, encouraging pre precipitation, a belief that actually continues to this day, um, so based on people that I spoke to in Chennai. And this moisture-laden environment led to extraordinary biodiversity and supported the expansion of human settlements. And as both Rukumani and Avantika mentioned, um, human and non-human communities living around the tank were essential parts of the assemblage as they depended on and continue, continually modified it. And in turn, tanks were dependent on human maintenance, namely for the removal of silt and strengthening of buns. But they were never really entirely under human control. Despite there being a mutual dependency, there was also a friction and a violence between the parts to draw on uh, Jane Bennett. Tank structures weakened as they shifted between wet and dry states, and communities living around the tanks had deep-seated fears of buns breaching during the monsoon season. But nevertheless, their longevity is indicative of a symbiosis between land, weather, humans and non-humans over time. So the tanks came to exist in radically different contexts than when they first emerged, and their transition to urban settings was bound up with processes of colonisation, which led to the founding of Madras in 1639 by the British East India Company. Madras began with a fort surrounded by villages and irrigated lands, which you can see there on, on the map. And as colonial rule strengthened, the colony expanded, incorporating villages and their tanks. 
the co colonial period also saw a reordering of agricultural lands and governance structures, as we heard earlier. And as commons, the tanks were categorised as poor and broke or wastelands under a newly devised re revenue system. The tanks were placed under the authority of a centralised uh, public works department, resulting in a separation between the tanks and society, leading to a maintenance crisis. And the tank system then went into slow decline from the 19th century onwards. So as Madras expanded, perceptions of the tanks underwent a radical shift with material consequences. And I'll just outline three um, critical conjunctures in, the, in this reformulation. The first um, being sanitisation during the colonial period where tanks are viewed as hazardous, and then filling in during the late colonial and post-colonial period where tanks are viewed as real estate, and revival from the 1990s onwards where tanks re-emerge due to environmental concerns. And each of these reconfigurations reassembled the territories formed by the tanks in different ways with consequences for the wider landscape. Um, so during the colonial period, tanks came to be viewed through different eyes, and this promotion of wetness by the tanks was not really welcomed by colonial settlers. Wet soils and rotted vegetation were believed to produce miasmas or unhealthy vapours, which were thought to spread disease. Tanks were determined as useful and non-useful, with seasonal and shallow tanks targeted for removal. Those that remained were deepened and sanitised due to concerns about malaria. Strategies to deepen tanks and remove in their so-called superabundant vegetation continued well into the 20th century. And this image comes from a manual outlining methods for um, the sanitised management of a tank ecology, um, with the section on the right uh, demonstrating a healthy tank with sparse vegetation. And there were ecologically ca um, oriented counter arguments, most notably by Patrick Geddes, um, which outlined an alternative role for tanks in the city, but these were ultimately overridden by sanitary agendas. So due to outbreaks of uh, cholera, tanks were replaced with piped water and drainage systems. And these infrastructures separated people from the tanks, which was also part of a kind of a conscious strategy to extend colonial control but it also had implications for relations between people and the monsoon. The tanks were a visible reminder of the monsoon. The rise and fall of water provided a way of tracing monsoonal cycles, um, and these rhythms uh, were concealed by alternative infrastructures. So the process of filling in the tanks um, proliferated during the post-colonial period due to shortages of land when tanks came to be seen as a waste of space. Large-scale tank appropriation began in the 1920s due to urgent demands for housing. The first casualties were the largest and most prominent tanks, uh, with the 1920 Town Planning Committee deciding to drain uh, the Nungambakam and Long Tank, uh, shown here, um, to create land for building sites. The 1970s and 80s saw another period of rapid urban expansion, um, and as government-owned wastelands, tanks were assigned for large-scale development. During this period, the World Bank-funded Sites and Services Project, also known as the Airy Scheme, identified tanks as defunct lakes, enabling them to be permanently drained and utilised for housing schemes. So Chennai had more than 600 water bodies in the 1980s, um, of which apparently approximately 27 remain today, although this, I mean, these numbers aren't, aren't um, confirmed. Um, and tanks really continue to have a spectral presence and can continue to act despite their disappearance, with certain parts of Chennai being inundated with water every year because they were once tanks. Uh, these incidents of flooding have brought about a profound shift in how people relate to the monsoon. Increasingly, people fear rather than welcome the rains, and following the 2015 floods, people described themselves as living in mortal fear of the monsoon season. So from the 1990s onwards, um, there's been an increased recognition of the ecological value of the tanks, um, possibly an example of infrastructure becoming visible through its loss. And following the 2015 floods, tank restoration activities have proliferated, but there are very different visions for how they should be revived. A purportedly ecological vision uh, based on how tanks worked in the past, and a beautification vision which sees them as urbanised lakes and leisure spaces. And the beautification vision is arguably linked to uh, neoliberal agendas because these lakes offer commercial value as well as appealing to middle-class desires. 
So reimagined as lakes, uh, tanks become aestheticised representations of pristine nature rather than human-made infrastructures. And in Chennai, there are concerns that tanks are being reconceptualised as tubs uh, to contain water rather than shallow interconnected structures that encourage overflow and wetness. Their management as lakes uh, feeds into public perceptions of them as natural water bodies, hiding the human agency in their creation and maintenance. And this brings us to Perangudi. Um, Perangudi Tank, now referred to as Perangudi Lake, where I did some field work last year, um, is representative of a, of a shift in public conceptions of tam tanks from, mon uh, sp sorry, from seasonal monsoon infrastructures to beautified lakes. It also reflects complex and embedded power dynamics and the ongoing influence of elites on tank assemblages. Uh, described as one of the few protected lakes of Chennai, it's been fully fenced and surrounded by a concrete walkway. Um, the transformation of Perangudi began in the 1990s, spurred by the development of the nearby IT corridor, with residential housing, gated communities and luxury apartment blocks constructed around the tank. And the terrain was reshaped to make the area more attractive to middle class tastes. Many of these new dwellings used the tank as a selling point reflected in their names, so for example, Lakeview Apartments and Falling Waters. Um, and as Perangadi developed, the morphology of the tank changed, um, largely as a result of successive desilting exercises. So silt taken from the tank was used in the construction of the IT corridor, um, according to, to local stories. And the lake has become deeper, meaning that it holds water more constantly, making it less prone to seasonal fluctuations. A sharper incline along its edge creates a clearer delineation between wet and dry, enabling houses to be built closer to its perimeter. The tanks become smaller, disconnected from its surroundings and less biodiverse. The compound wall and walkway have fixed the boundaries of the tank, creating an enclosed space that can be policed. And the shape has become more uniform, undulating curves and fluidity being replaced with concrete surfaces, straight lines and hard edges. The next sort of significant development occurred with the 2015 floods, which um, severely impacted on South Chennai, and the tank reached maximum capacity, prompting fears that it would overflow, bringing it to the attention of local residents who had previously been unaware of its existence. And then following the floods, a neighbourhood environmental group um, was founded to keep the lake clean and alive. Um, activities included weekly lake cleaning initiatives, tree planting, uh, drives and monitoring of, of pollution and encroachment. And this is the group um, shown here on the photograph. So these cleaning and beautification efforts bring the group into conflict with people from nearby informal settlements who rely on the lake for drinking water, grazing, fishing, washing, bathing and religious purposes. Um, with some of these daily activities being seen by middle-class residents as contributing to the pollution of the lake. Tensions culminate um, around temples constructed around the tank, um, and although temples have been a historically important part of tank assemblages, they're now described as encroachments. Ironically, the middle-class res residents who've built their homes on the edge of the lake don't see themselves as encroachers. Annual festivals are organised to encourage wider pub public participation, but the diversity of lake users is still not really represented in the lake protection group. Um, so after a long period of engagement, people, or a, a long period of people turning their backs on the tanks, they're being rediscovered and engaged with in new ways. Flood and drought events act as catalysts for intervention, illustrating the ongoing role of the monsoon within tank assemblages. So despite their ancient origins, tank infrastructures continue to matter. They elicit strong emotions, fear, disgust, and concern. And these emotions prompt reactions that in turn affect the tanks, illustrating that tanks are embroiled in, in relationships with urban publics in complicated ways. But although human imaginaries, emotions, and practices are a significant part of tank assemblages, they persist beyond human life cycles and exceed human attempts to control and design them. Um, so, just to conclude, um, as Chennai's boundaries are set to expand dramatically, potentially by over two times its current size, the city faces another historic juncture. Expansion into a wider territory composed of numerous tanks requires careful consideration of the role that they will play within the fabric of the expanded city. 
Understanding the various ways in which tanks have been imagined and engaged with over time and the varying consequences offers a starting point for potentially exploring different futures. Perhaps by more explicitly reimagining tanks as a monsoon infrastructure, weather can be acknowledged as a vital element of urban assemblages. And this just shows the proposed um, extent of the, of the boundaries um, and how many water bodies would be, would be affected. Thanks. All right. Um, uh, Mary, David, Beth, do you want to come up? I know, David, you have to leave at 5.30. Okay. So um, if you guys want to sit. And uh, so we've got a riverbank, a fake wave pool, and a water tank. And I want to think about infrastructures of feeling to take Raymond Williams and, and push it to infrastructures. Okay. Uh, questions? I was wondering if you interviewed anyone who was quite positive about the wave pools as opposed to being the fake wave pools as opposed to being completely negative about it. Yeah. And so, and if there were, what were their sort of advantages of it okay. in an embodied way and what yeah, yeah. they kind of experienced? So there was a very distinct um, gap, skills gap between yeah. um, positive and negative um, opinions of wave pools. Right. Um, almost everyone, when I, whenever I went to the wave pool, almost all users were not very good at surfing. Yeah. Um, so perhaps it's still somewhat of a novelty. Obviously the 50 pound price tag, no one can become a local at this beach if this is yeah, 50, uh, 50 pound if you want to surf it. Um, uh, beginners tend to think it's amazing. Um, I was talking to, I was taken aback, I was talking to, I was sent to talk to, uh, to interview the supervisor of the park because when I went up to all the staff members who I was told get to surf for free, I was like, okay, yeah. they must all be really good, you know, they get, get their skills down while they're here. Most of them hadn't had yet to use it. They're kind of like teenage kids who are like employed part time. So they just stopped me interviewing them and were like, look, just talk to her, okay, she's a really good surfer. Uh, she'll be able to answer all your questions. I was like, okay, that's great. Went over and started interviewing her. I was like, okay, so, you know, what do you think are the pros and cons? And she was like, oh, this is, you know, this is like a gym for surfing. Like, you can get it, you can really get your skills down. Um, Absolutely, absolutely amazing, um, but you know, you might know about stuff like rips and tides in the sea. And I, was, I said, oh yeah, maybe not duck diving, which is the technique of diving under the wave. And she was like, well, not even that. Um, I'm ashamed to say I still can't duck dive. And that's why I started talking about people learning the wave pool. I was taken, I just realized, it was like, hold on a minute, this is someone who I was just told is an amazing surfer. She's never surfed in the ocean. Yeah. Um, and she was, she was telling me how amazing these wave pools were and everything. But having said that, um, like my informants, my core informants out of the wave pool and back at home in Ireland do talk about it um, that if there was one down the road they would certainly visit it um, as much as they could afford because you don't what you it's very hard to practice surfing you don't get the same wave every time if you like nearly get a maneuver right but not quite you mightn't get a wave that would allow you to do that again for two months you know um, whereas if you could practice on the exact same wave the exact same time as like a sprinter might do their, yeah. their start um, you get it down so like as, as a a, mo a method of practice, um, to, uh, more skilled surfers see the value in it, but not as a, an instance of surfing, say. Question for Beth. Uh, uh, one is a very simple one. In the last slide, you had the picture of the Amman, uh, and I wondered what was the significance of the Amman uh, in, in the series of different activities. And then the second one is, uh, is there a middle ground between this very middle class beautification, aesthetized approach to you know the efforts of people like Arun Krishnamurthy and Environmental Foundation of India who says they have to be purely ecological? Um, is there a middle ground here? And uh, and <laughs> these are still very individual uh, efforts, individuated efforts. And so, where is the state in this imagination? Um, is a state-led ecological slash environmental imagination even possible here? Let's take. I saw three hands. Let's take this three questions, and then we'll take questions. Yeah, I have a question uh, for David. Um, is I was I. S saw all these similarities with another 
kind of uh, water sports skiing. Um, that is, and many of these arguments kind of are similar but between like backcountry skiers and like lift skiers. But now, like I just recently, the, the Austrian skiing industry has started um, sponsoring or even building these huge kind of artificial uh, ski halls uh, in 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 places like Dubai. So I was wondering, is there? I don't know. Are like the the, the surfing resorts of of Portugal or Bali? Are they kind of what do they say about the artificial waves? Are they sponsoring or kind of are they? Do they see this as a form of of um, recruiting new customers? Mm -hmm. I have a question for Mary, which is not directly related to water, but a word that you use quite often, which is local. Mm -hmm. So I was just interested in hearing your um, notion of local, mm -hmm. um, especially as you also mentioned that some of the people uh, move to that area after retirement. So I wonder if, if they're local as well or who is mm -hmm. local. Yeah. And I'm actually asking this question because I'm just trying to make sense of, of how a local is used in different ways. Yeah, sure. Um, well, that you guys respond, you chat questions, so that's perfect. Go ahead. Um, thanks, Pushpa, for the questions. Um, so the Amman, well, there were three temples sort of around the edge of the lake, and two um, were of a particular concern for this kind of lake protection society, um, and they were both Amman temples. Um, and I mean, the one particular was kind of more vulnerable and I think was, was kind of belonging to people living in informal settlements who kind of had been there for like a long time um, and very much kind of associated that temple with, well, it was more of a kind of shrine really with, with the, the tank. Um, and I believe that, I mean, historically, this association between that Aman rituals and the tanks is something that, that has a very kind of a long history um, um, and then, then in terms of I don't know the the lake revival kind of activities I think the kind of ecological vision and the beautification vision are kind of along a spectrum um, with kind of variations in between um, I don't think it's as clear as to say that there's one versus another um, and I think organizations like EFI are kind of um, playing a, quite a key role in organizing activities that are happening kind of on a more individual basis. Um, but I think that it's complicated the way that those things are being organized and the kind of politics involved in that. Um, but at the moment, as far as I can see, it's not so much connected with the state, but more looking at kind of getting funding from, um, from corporates and kind of IT companies and things like that. Um, so less of a connection with the state. Um, shall I go? So yeah. to the question, how, how do owners of um, surf, you know, pretty like established surf ranches respond to this artifice? Um, the idea of a surf park is, it doesn't really exist in the same way that a skiing park does. Um, whereas, like, so beginners, people that teach beginners how to surf, they want as many people in the water as possible. Um, but surfers, when they go to travel, um, you don't kind of sign up. You don't want an instructor go out in boats with you. And you, in Indonesia, you might want to rent a boat, but everywhere else in the world, really, all you want is a ten dollar a night hostel that maybe gives you free breakfast in the morning. And um, that's all the kind of you know, that's all you need for you to get to your wave. So actually, those kind of people want as little people in the water as possible. Um, and there's a kind of a split about what these wave, these wave technologies will do. Some people are saying that this is fantastic. All the beginners can just go and go to the comfortable new artificial wave park and they'll stay out of our good waves by the coast. Um, then, of course, the counter argument is, well, what's going to happen when all of these people realize how great surfing is? And then now migrate and we'll have double the amount that we currently have um, by the coast. So, yeah, um, there's no direct ownership between them. The, the WSL, the, the owners of the, um, the world tour, the professional world tour, have just bought um, a 50% a stake in the best wave pool technology and they're planning to run events on it and have it as a big spectator sport and all this and um, people are really up in arms about that and it's just going to change the whole image of surfing but yeah I don't think on the ground kind of business surf businesses aren't aren't really taking in all this I hope you don't mind if I leave on that or I'm going to miss my flight yeah, no, <laughs> okay no, thank, thank you. you so much no thank you, thank you.
thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and in terms of um, categorising the local, um, basically my criteria was if people lived or worked in these three waterside communities. And then whether they judged themselves to be locals or not was up to them as, as we talked through, through to, had a conversation together. So, uh, and it did split down, really, between people who had been there a very long time and had, had their fa raised their families in, in the villages, and then those who had... And who had visited the villages because they'd been uh, walking on the South Downs and seen these idyllic places where they wanted to live. And so had brought with them this idea of what retirement might be like, which then they told me was actually very different. And not, not, not negatively, I mean, there were positive and negatives, but on the whole, it was that it was not what they were expecting. I hope that answers your question. For Mary, mm. D did you come across anyone who was using the water in any other way than sort of decoratively or, or reflectively including drinking it or anything like this because I mean when I was younger there was this there was you know the guy in the village who would only drink from the well mm. and I don't know if that was real or just something that people said yeah but it kind of it was a way of hanging on to the idea that, the, that we were connected somehow yeah um, and not just kind of using the, the taps yeah well, it's interesting because I, as I talked to people, there were lots of stories from their youth. So definitely were lots of stories about people swimming in, in, the, in not the main river, but in the streams around the river. People fishing in the chalk streams has got a very good reputation for the chalk streams in that area. But they keep them very secret because they don't want anyone else fishing there. Um, at, in terms of people drinking out of, the, out of the river itself or using boreholes, I mean, the farmers I taught to use boreholes, but they didn't use it for potable for drinking water they use it for actually for their livestock and for cleaning down their dairies and things like that um, uh, but boreholes are a very sensitive issue because they're not metered and so people often, farmers often don't want to admit that they're using them because there's a, a tension there with the water companies um, and um, and actually then I met a brewer who would extract from 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 the river itself so because you know, as a and so he was very proud of his, of his uh, local brew. And you couldn't get more, more local than that, really. Yeah. the extent to that um, yes yeah, so yes yeah, so that was it so it, it was that that they started obviously with this issue based problem of the flooding around their houses but it did seem to lead to a wider awareness of actually changes to wider local politics and to national politics around political austerity and as I said in their reflection on their own role in their lives about maybe enabling that to happen about not not protecting that or ring fencing that so um, so I think then that there is an, uh, uh, they did have, I'm not saying they had an epiphany, it's certainly isn't that, but it's more of an incremental awareness that things could be different and getting involved in local environmental groups. But again, how widespread that is, I couldn't say. And the other thing I found from doing my research was, and this is not unusual for, for, for any researcher doing qualitative field work, is accessing certain types of age groups can be very difficult because people are working and they're commuting away from villages. And so I had an older cohort of respondents that I talked to and I'm aware that that's an influence on the, on the stories that I tell. But it, one of the people that I talked to ended up saying, well, you know, a lot of the people, they just sleep here, they don't live here because all they do is they get up, they take their kids to school, they go to work, they come back, they go. they're not involved in the life of the village that some of the older ones are. So I think there are some wider issues around the impacts of neoliberalism on people's everyday lives and their ability to connect to their local communities. Um, I think for me the Varangudi um, sort of 
lake was quite was really interesting because of the kind of confluence of politics taking place around the, the lake. Um, I think with both the middle class kind of environmental group, maybe, uh, I mean, from talking to people in Chennai, that there's this sense of frustration that people can't um, get, I mean, can't influence politics. So maybe that kind of involvement in these kind of environmental restoration groups are a way of, um, of kind of, of, of be being political um, in a way that they can't in a, otherwise. And then I think also the, the, t the tanks, I think, are also like uh, the temples, sorry, around the tanks, I think, are also a form of kind of, of politics but by people. I mean, weapons of the weak is a kind of term that I think applies to them. So people kind of exercising control, you know, they're well, oh, using the temples as a way to claim space um, that from, a, from a, a city that they're kind of excluded from. Um, so I was interested in those kinds of tensions, I suppose, that mm. came together around this particular place. But I don't know what that means in terms of wider. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have a question, right? um, it, it's, it's actually very similar to what yeah. Lindsay uh, mm -hmm. had, but I was wondering if anybody else had there a question. Um, but very quickly, I mean, I was, because I'm just, I mean, as a panel, uh, because when we were thinking this through, interlocutors and registers, it was just this like, this closing, but like final mediations, final material mediations, and in a way, I'm, I'm, I mean, David's uh, just walked out, but um, it, because it would have been, I mean, there's a polarity here, right? Because here is this really optimistic possibility for the future in terms of if we organize and come together, but at the same time, not realizing the the agency of every breath and every desire of consumption of a British human, which <laughs> reorganizes the planet from the banana to the, the tag on, 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 a, on a material, uh, to, on the other hand, the, the transforming toxicity of the earth, the peremboke, where the, the, uh, there is no agency for the human. The human is, is disposed into in, into into this vortex of modernity and the ener and and energy and processes of of active dredging and extraction, and it's uh, I, I was just wondering I mean how have, I mean because there is an interesting common ground here between the conversation that both of you are having I was, I was just wondering maybe there has to be a switch of sorts um, and a, a real I mean anyway so but that's that that's my that's my proposal and as yeah, comments welcome um, yeah. yeah there was one last yeah sorry i don't hear uh, i have some questions about the tank um, i i i'm just wonder um, if, if this tank is um, it's temporary to, um, place for collecting the rainfall or or the river from the monsoon uh, because in in uk most uh, lands um, are, are land by are borrowed from the farmer. They use their uh, agriculture land uh, as a place to st storage the rainfall. So it is not um, a temporary place because uh, if this place are used for collect rainfall, the the soil fertility uh, fertility is reduced. So it means it cannot be uh, as a, for farming or agriculture. Uh, so I mean. How to how to decide which place can be used for the tank to collect the, um, the rainfall, and how to balance the the interest from the farmer? Because in UK, if the farm lands uh, borrows their land for uh, for uh, for the uh, function of the tank, um, the government sh should pay for the each family um, every year uh, uh, um, amount of money to to as a consequence. Thank you. Do you want to respond? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think traditionally within um, agricultural systems, the tanks were used actually to maintain f fertility of the land. Um, so the, I mean, they collected sediment as well as water. And um, through the desilting, those sediments were kind of placed onto the agricultural fields um, as a way of kind of improving their fertility. So I'm not sure that those questions about um, you know, they're, they're where they should be located, where I don't think that that was necessarily like a, a, a problem um, because they contributed to the, to the system as a whole. 
Um, if that answers your question, I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether it does. <laughs> Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, in the email system, or at least in Tamil, uh, there is a question about uh, Okay, we have time for one quick question. Make it very fast because I need to hand it over to Lindsay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I think maybe people just engage with weather in different ways now. So it's not that a connection has necessarily been lost, but it's changed. Um, I think, and that's partly just through kind of everyday practices of, of living changing. Um, so I think people are still very much aware of you know of, of the weather and, and living. I mean, living with it, but it's just through different practices. Um, is my sense, but, yeah. Okay, thank you, Beth and Mary. We're gonna conclude there, and I'm gonna hand over to, thank you for both for very interesting papers, very rich, and I'm gonna hand over to Lindsay, so thank you. Thank you, well, I'm not gonna make any closing remarks. I think we've had enough <laughs> remarks for the day. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just gonna say thank you. Thank you especially for sticking it out to the, to the end, which is always quite, uh, quite it takes quite a lot of commitment. So thank you to everyone who's still here. Um, but I'd just like to thank um, the speakers for a wonderful two days. It's been extraordinary for us as a project team to have so much input into our project <coughs> and so many great generations generated by the work that we're trying to do. And we really do value um, everyone's contribution. Um, I'd also like to thank the Monas team who put this together, particularly to Anthony and Harsh and Zara, who have been really, really great in, in organizing, being the prime organizers of this conference. Thanks very much. And then, um, thank you. Where's Anthony? He is here. Good. And then finally, to my students who are all here, and especially to Georgia, Sarah, Constantina, and Charlotte, who were the, three, the four students who played a particular role um, in this symposium.
And finally, we um, our symposia produces a book each year. This is the book from last year. It's called Monsoon and Other Airs. It's available as a downloadable PDF online, or you can buy it from Amazon. And we are going to be asking the contributors to this symposium to contribute to our next book. So your work for us is not over yet. But thank you very much for the great conference. And join us for a drink at the back if you'd like to. Thank you. Mm -hmm.